Okay, we are live, and uh, hopefully we have some uh, successful audio this week. I'm fiddling around with a little bit of new equipment. Uh, we're bringing back the old Yeti microphone and a little bit of an extra monitor here to uh, track our progress. So uh, if there's any problems out there, I've got my ears on uh, on both sides here, and we'll uh, we'll adjust accordingly. So uh, a couple of things. the um, This week is uh, the last for about two weeks. We're going to take a 4th of July holiday break, a little bit of an extended break. I'm going to take the uh, big rig out. And, uh, you know, I wanted to wait till gas was the most expensive it could be and the temperatures were as hot as possible before we went camping again. So uh, we're headed out here in a week or two. Uh, to uh, a Corps of Engineers park, actually. So it should be fun. Um, so I will post uh, the next um, broadcast notification. Uh, we'll have a, a date of July 20th on it. And then we'll go every week from that point till the end of August. And that'll be kind of a wrap for the summer live sessions uh, as we prepare to go up to Hershey for the RV show and that sort of thing. Um, so I've got a few things to cover. Uh, made notes throughout the week and some things that have come up uh, that we want to talk about. Let me jump into some screen sharing real quick. And let's see. We're going to go. That's not what I want. Here we go. Make sure that looks right there. Okay. So a couple of things. The first real quick is... Um, if you didn't see the pop-up when you logged into TripWizard or you haven't logged into it in a little bit, you can always access under your, the help menu here uh, the, what's called What's New. And this week, the team uh, released a, um, a faster, kind of a leaner, cleaner, meaner uh, mapping engine, essentially, to, to make your navigation and your usage of TripWizard easier and smoother. If you're having any trouble with that, if something's gone awry on your end or something isn't right, just be sure and contact the help team. I haven't seen anything other than faster speeds. It's been great for me. But the way to, uh, to contact the team is to go back to your name here and go to help and contact. And you can just make a little note, maybe let somebody know if you're having a particular problem with a trip or whatever. Um, but this sends all kinds of other information uh, about your machine, your browser and things that are really helpful to our devs to figure out what might be going on if there's an issue. Like I said, I haven't seen a problem, um, but it's like anything, you know, if you're having trouble, let us know. Um, we can't help you if we don't know it's broke. Uh, let's see. Looking at my notes, uh, another quick note, just as a um, we've kind of got something out there that I think we. We sort of put together for trade shows and handouts and things like that. But there is an address uh, here. It's Linktree slash RV Life Pro. And the Linktree is kind of broken up with the E's or, or off. It's linktr.ee. But it's a great single point of contact for all of the things that we'd love you to know about. Obviously, the seven-day trial, if you're not already doing that, uh, getting the app, Trip Wizard, campgrounds, maintenance, YouTube channels, uh, contact support, just a, a nice handy dandy little place, um, a, a kind of a one-stop shop for some ha handy links uh, to reach us. Uh, so that's that. Um, now, I want to drop in here in a couple of things. The, the map I have on the screen right now, um, okay, Annette, I've got your I got you there, so we'll we'll let it ride for a few minutes, and then uh, and we'll see how it goes. Um, so the map I have on my screen uh, actually shows two things I wanted to talk about today. Um, you know, when you're traveling areas you're not that familiar with, you kind of you look at things and say, "Wow, this is interesting." And if we look at this route here from St. Louis to Denver, we look at this real janky little spot on I-70 that basically says, well, why the heck would I get off of I-70 and go what looks to be, you know, 40, 50 miles out of my way? It doesn't make sense. And uh, so we received this inquiry this week. And, well, the answer is really simple in this case. This person has, and let's go to it real quick. 
avoid tolls selected. Now, we can verify that by looking at the turnpike map from the Kansas Turnpike. And sure enough, this little stretch from Kansas to Topeka is a turnpike. So you're going to pay a toll. I, you know, I don't think there's booths out there anymore. There may be. Otherwise, they're just going to snap your license plate and send you a bill. So the moral of the story here is we really need to be careful when we're selecting these various avoids or at the very least, don't forget you've selected them, right? So uh, let's look at those real quick. And obviously avoid tolls we just talked about. Uh, we've talked about avoid highways in the past. Um, you know, that is a potentially adventuresome journey. I think it's really handy if you're looking for that local trip two or three hours away and you just don't want to take the same drag you take to work every day, right, if you commute to work. And you want to go somewhere out in the country a little bit, a Corps of Engineers, a lake, a campground, whatever, but you'd like to just take a scenic route, make it a little different than your everyday mundane, that little avoid highways is not a bad selection. If you're planning a cross-country trip, it's kind of another matter. Um, so, and then with, with all of these things, we are looking to segment these, and I'm actually um, coming back, jumping ahead to Annette's question here, we are looking to be able to segment some of these properties um, at the segment level. In other words, um, if I'm if I have a long trip and I'm really I'm fine with the, the highway or the freeway, but I get into the countryside or I get on Route 66 somewhere and I want to take side roads, I'd like to be able to turn that avoid highways on. Uh, at that segment level, at that journey level. Uh, uh, and so we're looking to get there. Uh, and that great question uh, there. Um, so we're looking to, to get there. This moment, it's not there. Um, so we really need to, to pay attention to these. Uh, avoid ferries, you know, is kind of self-explanatory. I, I would say, I'm, you know, here in the middle of Oklahoma and, and Texas, or in Kansas, you know, we're not that worried about that. Places where there are ferries and they're required to reach some of those areas, like Northwest, for example, um, you know, you, you have, again, you have to remember you've selected it. If, if you're looking at a route and it looks geographically, it's 20 miles, but it's a, you know, an 80 mile drive because you're going around what could have been a ferry ride. You have to remember, you've got that selected. So be sure and check that out. Um, avoid tunnels is really mostly unnecessary. Um, in a sense that because of the RV safe routing that's already built in, you're going to be circumvented around tunnels you can't fit into or tunnels. And we have, you can see I have the propane. Well, I don't have it here under RV info. We've got a propane setting. And so you'll be circumvented or potentially around tunnels that absolutely prohibit pro propane in any way, shape or form. Most of them, you just got to make sure it's turned off. But for those, for example, that say, we don't care if it's on or off. If you're if you're toting propane, you can't come through here. That that's you're already routed around that. So I guess barring claustrophobia or headlights that don't work, you probably don't need avoid tunnels uh, and avoid unpaved roads. We generally have on. Um, I think in this example, I was fiddling with something, but uh, that's perfectly fine. And as we've talked about in the past with unpaved roads, um, the um, it, most of the time, if you get an unpaved road uh, flag, it's usually that last quarter mile right in before the campground. Now, having said that, of course, if you're picking up and you're creating a route through, you know, some some areas that that are that are, are questionable or, or off the main drag, I should say is a better way of saying that, you'll want to heed that unpaved warning and make sure it's not an entire unpaved road. I took a shortcut. Uh, one time that was five miles of gravel and you know i it was it was the most miserable five miles of my life so um so back to that so we've got uh, so, so the, the whole moral of this again the, the point of the story here is if you've got some uh, avoids selected then be aware of that as you're planning trips and you're seeing anomalies such as what you see on the screen and then remember 
you have your default settings, but avoids can be customized per trip. So if I want to make a take a long scenic three week scenic route through uh, wherever, I can go ahead and put on some of those perhaps avoid highways or or this or that. But if I'm trying to make say sprint from one side of the country to the other, I might not want them on. So, uh, but they're customizable per trip. The other thing I wanted to show you about this particular map I have on the screen. Um, so if you've watched this channel for a while, and uh, we're going we're gonna to pause and just bounce down to some questions here. Let's just see what we've got. Um, let's look at a net. If, it would be nice if the toll selection would work just like the unpaved roads. Just give the notification. Yeah, that's actually a great comment, Annette. Um, I think we'll like to maybe pass that on to the dev team. Uh, that's actually a really terrific comment, and they may have already heard it. You know, uh, I will, I'll pass that on myself. Um, let me just make a note on that because it's a really a, a smart comment. Um, let's see, make tolls just like unpaved. So basically, warn you that you're up against a toll and not necessarily just yank you off the freeway like that. So, a, a great feedback. Thanks, Annette. Um, okay, so if I'm looking at this map, um, if again, if you've watched before, you know that me typically, I like to go just an average hours uh, per day of say about, let's say five hours when I create, when I have a driving radius. And then you'll see that I get the one big driving radius, right? Um, but for those of you that prefer miles, which is fantastic, you will go down and you will edit these numbers here. And we typically throw in, um, where's my uh, miles? We typically throw in three numbers, you know, 150, uh, say 200, two, I don't know how I got 265, but whatever. And you'll get a sort of a three ring that looks like this. That's just a little too much for me. I mean, it, it, it's great. I mean, obviously if I'm zooming in, I can see my minimum, my desired, my maximum, and that type of thing. And that's great. But one little trick you can do, if that's just a little too much for you, uh, too distracting, too busy, right? Um, but I was fiddling with this yesterday when I was helping um, somebody. And what I can do is set a minimum and set a maximum and then just duplicate that middle to one or the other, which essentially eliminates it. So if I want to go a minimum of 150 miles, right? I don't, I don't care what I'm doing. I got to go at least that much. I can set the second one to 150. And there's all kinds of creative things you can do with this mileage, uh, these mileage rings here. And let's say my maximum is 300, or 250, let's be reasonable, 250. Now, when I save that, you're going to see I get that two, two ring spot and my goal then is to find something right in that pocket right so if i'm leaving denver to go to st louis and it's the opposite here but that's fine this little pocket right here is where i'm going to look for a campground and then i know i'm in my minimum my maximum right it's just a little less busy a little easier to look at um, but just another way you can tweak and customize uh, rv life trip wizard uh, to do what you want it to do. Um, this Goodland KOA, nice. Uh, okay, so that was that. Uh, let me, let's double check our comments. This thing doesn't scroll as, as nicely as I'd like to. Um, I'm, I'm scrolling, I'm looking here with, uh, I got a small secondary screen and it's working. I totally agree with this kind of toll road. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a, a terrific comment, Greg. Good to have you on board again today. Uh, okay, let's take a look at what I've got next. Um, so another uh, another place, I, uh, another uh, thing that came up this week. And again, we've talked about it before, but it's it's good to uh, rehash and remind. And that is the location aware search. So the question was, hey, can I search for uh, wineries? in Trip Wizard. And if you look at our POIs, I don't think we have wineries there yet, and maybe we will at some point, but that's beside the point. It might not be wineries. It might be batting cages, right? I mean, it could be anything you want. 
And the idea is that, let's say I need a, for example, let's look at, let's say in Denver, just because I have it here. Um, and I'm in the, I'm going to be in the Denver area, say I'm going to stay for a couple of days and I want to, I want to go to a winery for whatever reason, right? So what I can do is zoom into somewhat of a reasonable zoo. I don't zoom. I don't want to be 50,000 miles out. And I don't want to be zooming right up where I can see the street. But this kind of general uh, look that I've got on the screen. And now I can type winery. If I just type wine, I'm likely to get a lot of uh, alcohol stores. But if I type winery, if you ignore the top part, which is all campgrounds, which you can see are kind of from all over the country, Virginia, California, Missouri. But if you come down under the places of interest, now I've got wineries relative to my search window. Cowboy Winery in Denver, Infinite Monkey Theorem, Theorem Urban Winery in Denver, uh, Deep Roots Winery in Bistro, Cow uh, Carboy, you know, I said Cowboy, it actually says Carboy. So anyway, and of course, I can click on one of these, figure out where the infinite monkey is. I get the purple icon, and now I know where it is. Now, whether or not I add it to my trip, if I hit it on the way, or if I just put a note in my campground stay that, hey, there's a winery. If I'm going somewhere I've never been and I want to plan ahead, you know, maybe you're traveling and want to meet, a, meet, a, meet up with a couple of traveling meet up, maybe your kids are in, in town, whatever the re reason is. But if you don't know the area, you, know, you need a way to search. You can Google stuff, but it's it's another step, right? And it's not as Google's going to take your location where you are in Google's perspective. So if I'm searching for wineries in Denver and I just type wineries, it's going to pull them out of Texas. But with and I'd have to go through extra steps to say wineries in Denver and whatever, whatever. In this case, not only can I find them very easily, I can add it to my trip. So um, anyway, just to, again, wanted to touch on that. It comes up fairly frequently. Uh, we will at some point soon give you the ability to take that and add it to sort of a day trip itinerary nested within your trip. I can't tell you exactly when, I don't know exactly when it's coming, but it's coming. And so that'll be a really nice feature. Um, okay, let's hit comments a little bit. Let's see, I think we're caught up with that. Um, all right, let me, uh, and just to reiterate, if you're out there watching on either the RV Life YouTube channel or the RV Life Facebook page, any comments you post, I should be able to read and answer live. And, um, and if you'll subscribe to the RV Life YouTube channel, you'll be notified every week when these uh, live streams occur, as well as any new videos that we put out, uh, training videos and whatnot. Um, again, we'll be doing a, a two week break here and then we'll be back July 20th and I'll, I'll post the reminder uh, out there and uh, reflect that date when that happens. So let's have your questions while we're thinking about it. All right, let me look at my notes. Um, we talked about, this is kind of important, we talked a moment about your avoids, right, in Trip Wizard. That's half of the puzzle. When it comes to navigating, we potentially have other avoids and potentially not. What does that mean? Well, let's share, and there's the train, um, let's share our screen. So... <laughs> So the original intent in the first 14 episodes we did here was to use the Apple AirPods and the noise canceling would block out the train. I think it did a pretty good job of it. I have no idea how loud that sounded uh, over the uh, infamous Yeti mic. So, uh, okay, we're going to stop sharing that and we're going to share our mobile phone. Okay, so... When we talked about the avoids a moment ago, we looked in Trip Wizard. We saw where we can decide what to avoid. Now, if I'm following a trip that I've created in Trip Wizard, I'm going to go to Trips. It's refreshing. And maybe I have that weird little 
no toll. Here's my no toll strip that we were working on, right? I would tap on it and I can hit navigate. Now, you can see here, my goal, if I've, if I've created a trip, and I say this every week, I think, well, if I've created a trip in Trip Wizard, if I've taken the time to create a trip and vet it out and check the locations and satellite view, street view, elevation, grade, whatever it is, I'm going to want to match that trip on my phone. I'm not just going to say, well, I just spent 10 hours planning. Let me just throw it in the toilet and, and let my phone decide something new. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pick match my route exactly. Now, notice when I do this, it it does that. I don't get any chance to choose any new avoids or anything like that. Okay, so let's back out of that. Now, what should happen if I choose it again and I just allow changes? I just go, yeah, you know, I don't really care. Just change whatever you want. Now I get a chance to choose these um, avoids. Now, there might be a scenario, I suppose, where you decide, you know what? I'm going to pick this because I want to avoid tolls or something. I, I want to avoid something I didn't think about earlier. I don't know. I don't know why you'd want to do that. But the point is, if I choose to allow changes or a more common scenario is not matching, you know, if I plan a trip in TripWizard, we're going to match the trip exactly. Okay, that's just 99% of us. That's what we should be doing. But if you're just kind of winging it, you know, and you say, hey, look, I don't want to plan a trip. I just want to go somewhere with my RV. I want to go to uh, uh, this park here. And I just want to, I just want to go. Well, if I do that, oh, yeah, they can't be the same. Sorry. I did it again. Let's find something else. Current location. There we go. Let's just try that. So if I just pick some ad hoc routing with my phone, I again get those avoids. Now, I, I've seen it before and I, I don't understand the, why somebody would want to do it, but they'll plan a trip in Trip Wizard and they won't use the trip in, in here. They'll come to the ad hoc and they'll just punch in an address and start checking off all these avoids and then wonder why the route is different. That's why you, you, you want to match your route exactly if you planned a trip. If you're just going to wing it like that and, you're, and you want to avoid tolls and ferries and highways and all that stuff, that's great. But we, you know, we have to kind of look at what our objective, are, our objective is and what we're planning. And, and uh, the majority of this live stream conversation is about training and about understanding new, you know, RV Life Trip Wizard is a heavy program that's incredibly powerful and has a little bit of a learning curve. And that's what we're trying to do is shorten or eliminate that learning curve. The app just does what you tell it. If you tell it, take me from A to B and I don't care how you, how you, how I get there, it'll do that. If you want to take A to B and avoid all this stuff, it'll do that. But it'll also follow the trip you've planned extensively and carefully in Trip Wizard. Um, so that was about the avoids that I wanted to touch on. I, uh, I guess before I bail from the mobile app, let's take a look at some questions. Okay. Uh, regarding the drag route feature, um, we're, we're surprised you suggest drag route as often as you do without cautioning that the new route may not be RV safe. Annette, I don't, a couple of things on that. I I don't like or use drag route very frequently. My preferred choice is always going to be to um, use a custom stop, at least within my practice. Now, the drag route will still create an RV safe safe route, and, and I'm and I may have to I may have to double check some stuff here. And then if there's if there's not an RV safe route, it actually lets you know. It, it gives you the yellow warning and says, no RV safe route available, auto route used. Um, so I, I think when we drag a route, it's still safe, but it gives you that warning if, if it's unsafe. Um, I've got some folks watching and listening that may ping me on that uh, to be sure. Um, but having said that, I definitely always prefer, and I will say this, I have said that if you choose to drag a route, 
the extra vetting on the route is on you. You've got a satellite view, street view, look it over, make sure you're happy with it. If you use a custom stop, or a, as I've shown, and I'll, and I'll go back and show this if we want. If you use a custom stop, then it's just, to RV Life Trip Wizard, it's just another stop, and you're going to get an RV safe route. Um, so we may demo the drag route versus custom stop again if we need to here. Um, let's take a look at this question. Does the system only ignore your RV safe attributes for that route segment or for the whole trip? Yeah, Annette, I, I don't think that's right. I, I think you're going to get, um, if it were to ignore it, it would only be for the segment, but I don't think it ignores it. Um, but if it does, it would only be for the segment that the waypoint is attached to. And that's some clarification we can get, uh, but I, I don't think that's the case. Um, Let's see what else we've got here. Uh, we don't use the app much, but of course, if you choose follow route exactly, will it notify of traffic delays and suggest alternatives? Uh, absolutely not. If you choose match my route exactly, it's going to match your route exactly. And you're, you know, if there's a traffic delay, there's a traffic delay. It's not going to deviate from your planned route. You know, the the problem with something like Waze, for example, which is great, right? But Waze will say, hey, there's a traffic jam. I'm going to reroute you. And you're in, a, you're in fact somebody's residential street getting around a traffic jam. We just can't have that with RVs. We are looking at traffic delays, you know, tools and scenarios, but they, not, they have to not only be available, uh, be able to respond to a delay scenario and, and reroute, it has to be an RV safe route on top of that. Um, so uh, if, you know, if... If you, to, to sort of speak to that a little bit, let's say you were in fact following your trip exactly and there was a huge uh, wreck on I-70, for example. We'll just use it to, to stay in, in uh, conjunction with our trip. Huge wreck on I-70. What I could do is bail out of my trip, go to the ad hoc navigation, put in a destination that's you know, maybe my final campground, maybe just manually put it in. And then when RV Trip Wizard offers you a couple of different routes or the, the mobile app, let's get myself confused. When you're, if you're, if you're using the app in that ad hoc fashion, it typically will give you two RV routes, at least if it can, if it can come, come up, if it can come up with some. And so now you could look at those two RV safe routes and say, well, this is the one I'm on. I don't want to do that. Let me take this other one. So you could kind of get yourself around a traffic scenario in that way by bailing out of your trip, using some ad hoc navigation. Uh, and then once you kind of get past it, go back to and get back on the road where you're supposed to be, go back to your trip and just continue navigating. So um, there is some flexibility in that. And let's go back to, let's, Greg's got a question here. Whoops. There we go. What would be the reason for effect, uh, for selecting uh, allow changes to route uh, on the GPS dash? Jab is a truly GPS. Yeah, Greg. So, I, you know, I've, I, I've come up periodically with um, with scenarios as to as to why I might want to allow changes to a route, and it, I, I don't have any real good ones other than maybe the one we just kind of talked about where. Um, I'm, I'm willing to let it pick a different route or give me some other scenarios. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I'm in the middle of a trip and I stay at the campground. We're there a couple of weeks and I'm ready to go on the next leg of my trip. And I see there's some uh, construction or something. And, and maybe I, I give that a try to try to circumvent that. Um, I, again, I'm just, and, and I'm a little bit different in that I'm driving a big rig. I'm 43 feet long, pulling a Jeep, and I'm just not willing to risk going places I haven't previously vetted in Trip Wizard. Um, uh, another possible scenario, and here's actually a, a good scenario for that, Greg. Let's say you are, you have a trip, you're planned, you've been matching your route exactly, but you've deviated from your trip campground you had reserved lost power 
Okay, so you were they scrambled around, they they booked you a reservation at a campground 20 miles down the road. So you just said fine. You add you know, either you used your GPS or it was 20 miles down the freeway. You didn't you know, somewhere where else, right? But you got there. You got to this new campground. Now, if and potentially it's in an adverse direction to your trip, you know, maybe it's 90, 45 degrees back and up the other way, and you're supposed to be going down this way or that way, whatever. So when I get ready to go the next day and I want to continue my journey, if I match my route exactly, it's going to try to get me up to my route and then keep going, which makes sense, right? It's exactly what we want. But if I'm way off in a janky other direction, I might, I'll, for that one day, I might choose allow changes, which says, oh, dude, I got a way more efficient route to get you there. And it's still RV safe because it doesn't make sense for me to go way over here to continue my journey. So that's a scenario where the allow changes might be real handy um, to still give you an RV safe route, but not force you to adhere to that fixed route that you're really counting on. And so it's a it's a kind of a one off, but that is a potential scenario there. Okay, so Annette's saying that it did let her drag to an unsafe route. So, so that's good. So let's go talk about that because I'm not a fan of drag route. I've seen too many people make too many mistakes with it. Um, so let's address it right now. Let's go to our screen again. And there she is. Okay, so we are back to our trip. So we'll just use this example. Um, we'll just use the Denver, whatever, for, for the case in point. So well, one of the things we've been talking about, one of the things Annette's been asking about here is if I turn on drag route, I can take this thing and just drag it. Whoops. Why am I doing that? Drag route is on. I can, yeah, there you go. I can just drag that road anywhere I want, right? And you can see, I think I dragged it through a field there's dirt roads. I mean, I, you know, and I don't have, the question is, is this an RV safe route? I, I don't know. You know, I, I, my assumption is maybe, but that's using the drag route feature. And obviously you wouldn't just willy nilly drag yourself into a field, but I've seen it happen over and over again. The better solution is to say, Hey, I need to get on this road for whatever reason. You know, maybe there's a a mailbox or somebody you're picking up. I don't know why you'd want to be down here, but let's say there is. Instead of dragging a route and being really imprecise, a lot, imprecise a lot of times, I can right click right here and create a custom stop. And now save that. Now, I still get a dirt road because there's a dirt road, but I know this is an RV safe route because I'm not doing anything manipulative to uh, game the system. Uh, I am just creating a stop. And whether that's, that stop could be a rest area, a campground, the side of the road, somebody's house, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a place I chose to stop. Now, if this was any weird spot that was not RV safe, then I'd get the yellow warning, hey, no RV safe route found. Um, to me, this is a far simpler, uh, far more reliable solution to drag routes. Um, th that's just me, and especially when folks are um, on a touchpad or something, like an, an iPad, trying to manipulate that with your fingers is a little bit tough. But zooming in and holding down, you get the menu for create stop, and I can create a stop. And if I had to manipulate this even more, let's say I didn't want to get right back on 70 there because I needed to stop on the other side of the Air Force Reservation. I can again right click, create a custom stop. And now you can see my one of my drag routes right here. But now I've gone down and, and I, you know, I, I'm, oh, it's because I left drag route on. Never leave drag route on or you'll find yourself doing just what I did there. But again, I can create a custom stop here. It reroutes me. 
to an RV safe route. And if it wasn't safe, it would show me. So that's a better alternative um, to drag routing. I, I have yet to find a scenario where custom stop doesn't do just as, as good as drag route. Um, because now it's, again, it's just another stop and Trip Wizard's going to use all of my measurements, my weight, my height, and all of those things to route me to these stops. Uh, okay, let's take a look. Like, take a look at this. Um, yeah. So, like anything, generally the app is going to provide any of the routes initially uh, that are provided are going to be the fastest route possible. And then that's usually option one. Then a second route, and we're talking about the mobile app again here now. Um, and we're talking about not so much following the trip wizard, but if you do any ad hoc or allow changes, you're always going to get the most obvious direct fastest route. And then potentially one to two other RV routes that you could take that are just different for the sake of being different than the, the main route. Um, here again, you know, if I'm if I'm on my phone and I'm behind the wheel and I'm I'm letting my phone decide a new route without previously vetting it, I'm just not comfortable with that. If I'm in a Jeep pulling a teardrop, maybe I am, but I'm not in a big rig with a Jeep behind me or a giant fifth wheel. I'm not comfortable with just randomly letting it choose. I'm going to plan in Trip Wizard. Now, there are going to be emergency scenarios or, or things like that where you, you can't do that. Or you don't have time. Something's come up. You have to go. At that point, you rely on the app and know that it's going to be RV safe. Is it the route you would have preferred or the route you're used to going? Maybe not, but at least it's going to be a safe route. Let's see what we've got here. Yeah, um, and again, with the drag route, there's nothing wrong with using it as long as you're willing to do the homework of vetting it out. You know, one of the things we don't have turned on right here is, let me see if I get that, is I don't have my low bridge signs and things like that put on. There's really a couple of things here. There's a database where RV Trip Wizard is just not going to let you go based on your rig, oops, sorry, based on your rig height. But then you can also, we also have a database of visual signs that have been plugged in that I can actually see. Of course, that's the dirt road sign. But I can see that here in the Denver area, I mean, I don't have a lot to worry about with um, height concerns until I get into downtown proper. And now we've definitely got some areas that, you know, if I'm drag routing and I end up on one of those things, that's not what I want. Uh, and in fact, let's just try that. Not a big fan of winging it, but let's just wing it and see what happens. If I drag this thing over, of course, it tries it keep it wants to keep me on the freeway, which makes sense. I don't know if I can manipulate this even more. There you go. So the drag route is going to let me get on that road. So that kind of proves what we had. Uh, asking about. So it's up to me to turn on these signs and vet this out. If I'm going to gain the system and by, by trying to drag route, I'm taking a risk. Now, if we turn drag route off and delete the trash can, let's see if we can force Trip Wizard to get on that road. I don't think we can. Let's do a custom stop here. And now let's see if we can get it down here. Okay. Now, what are those heights? What's my height set at? Now I can't tell what the height of that bridge is. What am I? What's my height set at here? And RV routing. Twelve seven. So, I don't. It looks like it's taken me off that main road, though. So that's that's an interesting one. Because it's bringing me off of this road. So 
We'll, uh, we'll have to investigate that one a little bit. I, I've used that scenario before, and it will not let me route. So it may be pulling me off that one road. It's it's hard to tell with the granularity here. Um, so anyway, let's uh, let's see what else we've got here. Whoops. Almost, almost blocked you, Greg. Okay, that's it. No more questions there. All right, let me look at my list of things to cover again. Okay, uh, recalculating expenses. Uh, so this came up this week. And the question was, why? Let me pull up a trip that's actually got some decent expenses and things on it. Um, this one. The question came up, why have under expenses, why would I want to have recalculate expenses for all stops? So the, the reason that might be handy is if I'm, and this is a, a right now is a great idea, a great, a great example. I got this giant trip that's being planned, but we haven't taken it yet. And when I started out, I had gas at $3.00. Last time I looked at this trip, I had gas at $4. And now gas is, let's say, it's at $5. Camping expenses, you know, I think I usually have 50 bucks in there, but let's just say summertime average, that's gone up to 60. The point is, I would want to recalculate my whole trip now with these new values, especially as I get closer and closer to that trip. I would say, yeah, recalculate these things. Otherwise, it's only going to affect um, stops and, and, and items I add from this point forward. Well, that kind of does me no good. But for a trip I haven't taken yet, I want to recalculate that. Now let's flip it around and say, what if this was a very long trip? And um, I didn't say that. What if this was a very long trip and I spent, uh, instead of two days at Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga, let's say I spent three weeks there. And then as I was, and maybe stopped my planning, right? probably a more likely scenario is, let's say this is the first half of my trip. And now I'm gonna stay at Craters of the Moon for a month. Okay, I don't know how long we stay there, but we stay, let's say we stay there for a long time. Now I'm gonna build my trip going home. But it's been a month since I left home. Well, the here again, the values have all changed. But if I go and I update these values now, these are for my trip home. I don't want to recalculate all of them and, uh, and falsely affect the ones I've already um, taken at that value. The gas was $3 then. The camping fee was $45 then. But coming up on the rest of my trip coming home now, the values are, are skewed. The gas is double that, right? And the camping camping fees may be higher, whatever. So I don't I want to change my value, but I don't want to recalculate from items in the past. So that's why that is there. The recalculate, yes, no. Um yeah. So that again, that was just something that came up this week. Um, and that was uh something we wanted to cover today, just to let people know about that. Um, as we've talked about before, you can set expenses for this particular trip, but I can also, set, you know, I have my default settings where I'm going to set um, expenses. You can see mine are $50 and $3. These are my default settings that every new trip starts with. And if gas doesn't change in the next few months, I'm going to have to... <laughs> I'm just going to have to up my, up my value and my default settings will be higher. But um, for this trip, that's, that's, that's what they are. So you, you always have your default settings that every trip starts with, and then I can customize them on a per trip basis. All right, let's see if I've got any questions. Did I already get that one? Yeah. And nothing new, no flag there. Okay. So let's look at we're we're coming up on an hour almost. Uh, we we talked about the, uh, the the new faster maps, the upgrade from the team there. Um, we we went over the drag route versus customer. I guess I didn't. Well, we did kind of go over that. Um, where I can use a custom route to manipulate the route instead of a drag route. We did we did go over that. 
Uh, we talked about the tolls and the avoids and where the avoids are in both Trip Wizard and the mobile app and um, matching a route versus allowing changes, recalculating in the, the, dri the uh, driving radius tweak. Uh, which we start out. Now you can see it for this trip. Whoops, sorry. For this trip, I've got driving radius turned off. My general rule of thumb or, 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 or kind of MO, not so much rule of thumb, is once I've got my um, campgrounds locked in, I can turn, I'll turn my driving radius off just to fiddle with all the other stuff. I just don't need it kind of in the way because the driving radius for me is primarily I need to know where I'm supposed to stop at the end of the day. Once I've got that locked in, I kind of don't have to have it anymore. All right, let's take a look at this. I notice that you cannot add your pre-trip starting gas cost from the starting point. Can that be changed? Okay, so Greg's got a question. You guys should be able to see that on the screen. Um, so when I leave a, when I leave on a trip, let's let's talk about that. Right now, you can see with this uh, Mount Rushmore trip we have on the screen, we're leaving Daytona, and you can see I've got one, two, three, four, actually five. You can't see this one behind, but there's a fuel warning there. I've got my fuel warnings, and obviously they're throughout my whole trip because I have yet to add fuel to my to my trip. I don't have any gas stops yet. That's in the process. Um uh, generally, I'll, for, I'll cement all, this was kind of a test trip, but I'll usually get all my campgrounds, all my campgrounds done first, and then I'll do rest stops and grocery stops and things like that, because that is all going to account for my movement, and then I'll lay in the fuel stops last. Well, right now, Trip Wizard assumes, you can see my first stop is here in Macon, Georgia, it assumes I'm leaving Daytona with a full tank of gas, right? Well, if I've been camping there for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, um, I might have used some fuel. Uh, for me, uh, in my rig, I mean, I'm all electric, so I would have used fuel for heating, for the generator, that type of thing. If you're pulling a fifth wheel, your truck, you're running around town with your truck, and obviously you have the luxury of just bopping into a regular size gas station and filling up that truck before you go, but if for some reason you don't or whatever, you have a motorhome that the fuel tank isn't full, we can account for that. So I can go here to my very first stop, click on the pencil, and I can see, in fact, I've already, it looks like I've already done this. So my fuel capacity is 100 gallons. So in this case, I, I know I've used a quarter of a tank and my, uh, my fuel is actually only 75 gallons. Um, so when I say that, let's say it's half a, let's say it's half a tank. Let's say, oh, dang it, it got cold. I use my heater a lot more. Well, let's, let's say I got 50 gallons. So I hit save. And you can see it recalculates all those fuel stops. My first fuel stop now is not Macon, Georgia. It's right outside of Lake City, Florida. And so it recalculates. Now, I can go into that first stop and... I guess if I wanted to, I could, you know, right now I can override that fuel cost. Um, I guess I could theoretically say, well, I've been here a month and the first 50 gallons were at $3. So I could override that. And then my subsequent stops, I'll, you know, we'll fill in at the regular price. So I think, Greg, that would answer your question not only from a starting capacity standpoint, but from a cost standpoint. Um, so I hope that helps some. Let's see. When we update the name of a stop, the highlighted route to and from that location goes away. We have to close and reopen the program to get it back. Ideas. Um, yeah, Annette, we would want... I would love for you to send that trip name yeah, or, or, or the information to our help desk uh, via that contact that we, we started out showing. You know, click on, your, um, click on your little guy here and go to help and go to contact and send us that information. We want to know that. It may be related to the new mapping that we just introduced the other day. Um, it's it's much faster map drawing. 
But if you're having that problem, we definitely want to know about it. And we'd really like to know um, which trip that is that's happening, that that's happening to. And, and our team can figure that stuff out. Um, good to know. And we definitely want to know about it. And it's one of those things, I mean, I could use this for two hours and not see it, not experience that or, or ever experience it. And, you know, and that might experience it every time. It could be browser related. It could be cache related. It could be version related to the, who knows, but that's what our team will help you uh, figure out. <laughs> okay. Great question, Annette. Um, I don't have any other specific topics. I, I, I've covered everything I wanted to hit today. So now is the kind of the last call for questions. Um, and a reminder, while you're, while you're thinking about your questions, uh, remember, we'll be back July 20th. I've got a question from David. Um, it would be nice if there was recognition of where I am when clicking on elevation when looking at it. Uh, okay, this is a pretty interesting comment. David, I like that. I think maybe we're halfway where you are. We're we're, we're halfway there, David. Um, although, let me say this. I think we have what you need, Dave. But since Trip Wizard itself isn't a location aware tool, it's not going to work in that regard. It's all about planning, and it's not really location aware. However. I can see what's what. In other words, I can see where the elevation and gradient issues are. So let me talk about that. If I turn on elevation, right, I see, oh my gosh, look at this. It's like a giant mountainous landscape. Now, as I move my mouse around here, if you look at the route right now, if you look right under the word Montana, there's an orange circle like a little donut there. That corresponds with where my mouse is on the elevation scale. So when I look at this mountainous area here, I can see where I'm going to be start running into that. In fact, as I book through South Dakota, it's kind of about right here. And I could zoom in a little bit more. Obviously, you see right here. But the minute I get to Rapid City is where this elevation really starts to change. And I can follow that orange ball around through this section. Now, um, let me just double check a comment here. Ah, okay. Let's make sure I turn off this comment. Very good. Okay, thanks for the tip, guys. So as I move my mouse along this scale of elevation... You can see here right around the Rapid City area, thanks, Bear, um, I have that orange donut, that little orange ball that's showing me exactly where this elevation occurs. And you can see that. Now, I, before I bail from that and show you something on that, if I look at the gradient, I get the same scale, but I also get a, 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 a gradient chart. And I can see from this chart that even though... This looks, whoops, hold on. This looks, you know, scary and daunting. And oh my gosh, it's like giant cliffs I'm going to fall off of. But when I look at this gradient, it's like, you know, 2% or less. So it's really not that scary. But if I really wanted to look at this more, let's look at where the orange ball is. We can see it's right in this area. Let's go to Street View and see what that looks like. Let's see how terrifying this looks. Oh, I didn't get it on a street. Probably dragged it into a field somewhere. Let's get a little closer. Okay. So that big, scary, spiky altitude is, is nothing because it's such a grand scale. Part of this is skewed by the fact that this is a 2,500 mile trip. So of course we're cramming 2,500 miles worth of data in this little spiky area, which 
really, as we see, that same segment right there. Where's my donut? Going a little fast. I got to find my donut again. Here it is. So we see that that little segment right there is actually nothing. I mean, it, it's just one or two percent grade. It's nothing to be concerned about. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, yeah, David, David found the orange dot. It's not a big dot. <laughs> it maybe needs to be brighter or larger, but again, you add overhead to the experience and it makes things slower, which is problematic for folks. Um, let's, let's see what Janet's got a question. Can we go over why location detection for my browser is requested when I open RV Trip Wizard and the app? Sure. Uh, like many things, and I think I can leave this up for now. Um, when I start a new trip, and let's call it minutes trip. If I'm going to choose use my location, it's going to want permissions from my browser and from my computer to take all that IP address information and just freely give it to me so I can use my location. Well, that's really great as long as that's where I'm actually starting my trip from. The problem is we've all gotten so security conscious that we just immediately, no, 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 I don't want you to know where I am. Well, if, if I'm planning a trip from here to somewhere, I kind of need to know where you are, right? And that holds true for Trip Wizard uh, as it does the mobile app. You know, Android is pretty bad about, it says, yeah, I need to know your location and I need access to 96 other parts of your phone. And that's, a, that's an Android problem. We try to mitigate that as much as we can. Um, but yeah, if it's going to route you from a, from a GPS standpoint, of course, it needs to know where you are so it knows how to route you. From TripWizard's perspective, if I'm planning a trip from where I am right now, it would be good for it to know where I am right now. Um, so if I hit use my location, I'm going to get prompted with my browser, and it may or may not be super accurate. You know, the thing with location uh, awareness is it goes back through the cell towers and through your internet provider and all that type of thing. And it's not always exactly where you are. That's not a fault of Trip Wizard. That's simply the way your ISP is reporting your location. So if you're not, if it's not showing you exactly where you want to be, then you can just go right back and choose, you know, this is, uh, and again, it all depends on your carrier and how much is being allowed up and downstream uh, through the routers and through the switches and through the internet and, and your service provider. You know, when I'm at home, like right here, this is a fairly rural area. This is spot on. When I'm at home, my location um, on virtually anything I do reports a town that's about four miles away because that's where the big switch is and that's where all the funneling stuff comes in and that's where it thinks I am. And that's just, that's just life, right? So when in doubt, if you're creating a new trip and the location, the, the current location isn't working, um, and it's certainly I've been in office buildings where their firewall just simply says, no, you're not getting that information, okay? Then just use the address, right? If I start a new trip again, and we call it a uh, test. I don't care what it's called. I can just use an address, right? I don't have to use current, my current location. You know your address. Just use it, okay? Uh, similarly, I might not be leaving from my home. We talked about this a little bit last week. You might be leaving from a storage facility, or you might be leaving if you've got a, a rig in National Indoor RV Centers. They have this valet service, and they just fire up your rig and get it all nice and cold and check the tires and all that junk and pull it into a bay and it's ready to be picked up from there. Well, that's where I want my journey to start, uh, which for me, a little, I don't, I don't use, I don't have my rig there, but that facility is 25 miles away or 20, 20 miles away or 25 minutes. I don't know. It ain't here. Right. So I'm going to put that address in. Um, let's see if I've got anything else going on here. Uh, okay. So I'm going to put that address in to start my trip, or maybe it's a storage facility, or maybe you're in a campground, right? Again, we talked about sitting somewhere, maybe you're work camping all summer um, and you're ready to go. Well, put that campground's address in or just use the map, right? 
and find the campground. Let me get this trip back up, turn on my campgrounds. And maybe I'm over here. Maybe I'm at North Lake and this is where I've been summering and now I'm headed home. I'll start my trip from here. That was fun. Oops, that was on me. Let's pull that trip back up. You know, obviously it's browser based, so we are plenty flexible. So whatever it is, if I'm at, I'm at a campground, I need to find a campground, city park. Okay, no amenities, great. You know, I may be overtaxing my uh, internet allotment here on this bandwidth. We uh, this is a this is a barely getting by internet connection here in this rural rural area, and we are hopefully upgrading soon. So. Um, okay, let's see what else we've got question wise. Let me log back into a trip. I'm going to pull up our other trip again, which was our no tolls trip. Um, so Janet's question is, will, uh, will it work with, so we just got done talking about the location awareness services. Certainly from a planning standpoint, as we just demonstrated with plugging in an address manually or choosing from a map, um, the, uh, from a planning standpoint, you can definitely do without the location awareness. From a GPS standpoint, <laughs> you can plug in a from location and you can plug in a to location, put them both in manually. And as long as your GPS is functioning, you can, again, navigate without that um, current location prompt from your phone, um, you know, where the phone wants to know where you are. Now, let's be clear. If you're going to use your phone to navigate, it needs to know where you are. Um, but just from that current location standpoint, you could manually plug in the address you're at, you are currently sitting, and the address you are headed to, and you could you could navigate that way. Um, particularly if you download the maps ahead of time and you're relying solely on that GPS chip and the the downloaded maps, you could still get from point A to B. Um, you don't have to allow your phone to use your current location, but if you don't, bear in mind you'll have to put in. A starting point. Um, there's also, and while I'm in this, and David's got another question. Uh, oh, a good question. Another quick point about this is um, with iPads and ta and tablets. You know, those are unique breeds in that they have a web browser, so I can use RV Life Trip Wizard, and they have an app store. You know, they have the ability to download an app, so I could use the RV Life app but most tablets do not have a GPS chip. Unless you're paying for a separate cell phone data plan, you're, you're not going to have the, 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 the services, the navigation. You know, it's in our minds, it's like, oh, I got a phone, why not use an iPad? It's huge, I'll put that baby up on my dash and navigate with a nice big screen. That's great if you're paying for a separate cellular data plan and your iPad is so equipped. If it's just a regular old iPad that works on Wi-Fi, it's not going to work. But you can smart the system out, right? No, you can't. Everybody wants to say, well, I'll just hotspot from my phone, right? Then my iPad has internet. That sounds great. And in some cases works a little bit. But the problem with that is it's still not using a true GPS chip. It's using your internet from your phone. Well, where's your phone getting its internet? Well, from a cell tower, not from the GPS, from the, you know, which your phone has a GPS chip. It's not getting a satellite signal there. It's just getting internet. So if I'm on, I back to our I-70, if I'm on I-70 heading west and my cell phone's connected to a data tower on a cell tower two miles north of me, guess where your iPad's going to think it is? two miles north of where you really are. So now your iPad's like, hey, we're in the middle of a field. We got to get on the freeway somehow. So you can't do it, okay? If you've got a cell phone for your tablet, a cell phone plan, a data plan, a real GPS in your tablet, 
you can use it. Otherwise, no. Um, all right, let's look at David's got a good question here. Why can't I see it? There it goes. Is there a session where you have covered using Street View? You know, we've covered Street View a bunch over, but there's no reason we can't just cover it again right now. Um, okay, so there's really two ways to get to Street View. And if we wanted to, for example, if um, let's let's get rid of these weird stops here. But let's talk about Street View. And let's turn on some campgrounds and let's say, oops, I deleted the wrong one. Let's delete that one. Let's add a campground real quick. Hold on. We're just going to add that. And then we're going to blow away this weird stop here. And now we've got a mostly normal trip again. And we still have avoid tolls turned on. So we still have this janky spot right here. But let's say I want to look, I've decided we're going to go to this KOA but I want to vet that area out, right? I want to know from a, maybe a satellite view or a, more importantly, from a street view, what is this going to look like getting into this thing? I want to know what the entrance looks like. I'll even do stuff like, I want to know what the exit looks like. So let's do that. Let's zoom in. I can either take this little pyramid. It looks like it's, it's a street. Like it's supposed to be a piece of highway with dot, you know, with the center line on it but it also looks like a weird little Inca pyramid or something. I'm going to drag this thing on and I always just put the tip of it and I can let go right here. And that usually works. And you can see it puts me on the highway and I can look around. Now that's, you can see the KOA there. I can just scooch down a little bit. And the idea is I want to get a better look at this KOA. Now, that's one way to do it. The other way is to just zoom in and right click and choose Street View from here. This is important for tablet folks to know because you don't have the way to drag stuff to, to drag that Street View icon. So you just press and hold, zoom in close, press and hold, and you'll get that option. Now, I can see the KOA off to my right. Very often, I'll want to know, you know, what does this exit sign look like? And I zoom in, and eventually, I can see it's exit 310. And there's, again, everybody's a little bit different, but to me, there's something about visually seeing, yes, I'm going to be following instructions, yes, I'll have vetted the trip out, but I can actually see the exit sign and have a sense, oh, yeah, 310, Bunch of janky oil refinery things over here. Sorry, I'm using janky a lot these days. Um, I have a better sense of what that looks like. Now, if I want to say, okay, that's cool. I want to see what the turn in looks like. And this is, you're kind of at the mercy of whether Google's done a street view here. But I can right click right here by the campground. And of course, railroad tracks. I should have expected nothing else, right? Um, and I can see... There's my KOA. And I can just get a sense of what does that turn in look like? How tight is it? You know, this is fairly typical tight tree-ish KOA. I'm going to come around that corner and need to make a turn. Again, maybe you don't need this, but we've got it. And I just feel comfortable when, I, when I've seen things ahead of time. Um, so that's the two ways to, to get into Street View. Obviously, we've looked before at Satellite View. Same thing. This just reinforces what I've looked at. 310 gets off here, take a couple of loops, and this is what my KOA entrance looks like. It just gives me a sense of security, knowing when I'm driving... I can just enjoy the drive. I don't have to wonder what's the turn look like? Am I going to miss it? What happened? What does the road look like? How tight is it? it? Whether it's a campground, whether it's a rest area, whether it's a fuel stop, whether it's a Walmart or a Cabela's or your kid's house, you can vet that stuff out and, and know what you're getting into ahead of time. So hopefully that was helpful, David. Okay, um, I think we will, oh, this is a great question. 
Should a full-timer break up their travel into different trips or one big trip? Really great question from Paige. Thanks, Paige. Um, I think there's some merit to breaking those up depending on how long they are for a couple of reasons. Uh, one would just simply be the, the financial thing we talked about where uh, if I decide I want to apply a new expense value to this next leg of our journey, um, I could do that to a, an entire trip and just kind of segment that trip. You know, what did that, what did the trip into my location cost? What did my next segment cost? So just from a cost standpoint, particularly if you're staying somewhere in a long, a long amount of time, it's a nice way to break up cost. Uh, the other way would be to break up the amount of stops just from the standpoint of load time. You know, when we're on, I'm at home, I'm on 800 up and down fiber. I'm not worried about load times. I can load the entire internet, right, in, in, a, in a second. But when I'm in an RV and we're traveling and I'm on my Verizon hotspot or I'm on my 4G, uh, any of those types of things, um, I... I don't have great internet all the time. Campground Wi-Fi is notoriously slow. So by breaking trips up into smaller chunks, I'm going to have less load. I'm also going to have a faster save time. If, I make a, if I'm making a change to a trip that's got 200 stops on it and I'm on slow internet, it's going to take longer and there's a risk of you know failure, of timing out and things like that. Um, and so... I don't know what the magic number is. I always like to throw the number 100 out there, 100 stops. Um, you kind of have to figure out what works for you as far as speed and load times and comfortable comfort level and things like that. But it's, it's, there's definitely some merit to breaking up larger trips into smaller chunks. Uh, great question, Paige. Um, just double checking our comments, make sure we didn't miss anything. Um, make sure I got feeling anything from the field here. Okay, uh, very good. So let's do another uh, another last call for questions. Um, while you're doing that, while you're thinking of your uh, your last questions, a couple of reminders again: uh, subscribe to the RV Life YouTube channel. Um, You'll be alerted when new live streams are scheduled, and you'll be alerted when new videos come up. We should have a dedicated training video just on the mobile app coming really soon. Um, obviously, the, the the video, the live streams, we'll do all summer. Two-week break coming up. The next live stream is July 20th, and then we'll hit it every week from there to the end of August. Um, obviously, our Facebook channel, we have... Uh, the same broadcast simulcast to the Facebook, the RV Life Facebook group. So if you're more interested in being on that side, subscribe to that group or follow it, like it, and that sort of thing. And I think you'll be notified of the videos there as well. Um, don't forget to subscribe to, you know, if you like, um, we do send out reminders about this broadcast in the RV Life magazine newsletter. Um, and so if you're not already uh, subscribed to the RV Life newsletter, just go to rvlife.com, click magazine. It's a digital magazine. We're not going to mail you anything. Um, but then you'll see the newsletter sign up for that. Um, we'll, uh, I don't think I have anything else for you. And I don't have any more comments that I can see. So we're going to call that a wrap. Everybody have a great 4th of July holiday. Uh, travel safe and um, try to save gas <laughs> any way you can. I don't know how much of that you can do. Um, but uh, have a great next couple of weeks. I'll talk to you soon. And save up those hard questions. Write them down and uh, bring, them with you on, bring them with you on July 20th when I'll see you again. Thanks. Have a great week. Bye.